favourite sort of motorway things. You're also the sort of person who goes around having children that you don't acknowledge or having a different father from the one that you said. And so there's some quite, quite interesting issues arise in that. Um, some of the civil liberties uh, people are very concerned about the potential to uncover family secrets. Now, I want to tell you one other thing. Um, the DNA profile which the police get it basically, when it's in the computer, it's just a series of 20 numbers, and it tells you nothing about a person. It's like a fingerprint. You know, if you have my fingerprint, then you can get me when I do a crime and leave the fingerprint, but that fingerprint doesn't tell you anything about what sort of person I am. If you've got the DNA on the other hand, you can find out all sorts of things from the DNA, and how much you can find out keeps going up each year, and... <coughs> People get very worried that you can find out all sorts of personal secrets by looking at your DNA. Now, actually, I, I don't think you can yet, but you know, come back in 10 years and you know, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that's very small. I think you, you get the occasional people who are sort of the reverse of twins. They've actually got the genetic material. They, they started out as twins, but only one baby was born, but they includes genetic material from both. And that, that, that happens. It's discovered usually when they type you for blood groups before surgery, and you find someone who's got too many blood groups. I, I think that's pretty rare. Um, but, yeah, non-paternity is obviously an issue. I mean, it's, it's so with all of these genetic things, isn't it? You're, you're looking at the real biological relationships. Same with sex. I mean, you know, if you do a genetic sex test, you're looking at someone's biological sex. That may not be the sex by which they're living, so which we call gender. So, yeah, there's, there's, there's various sort of loose links. Do you look at a gene called AMAL? And if you do a standard laboratory test on AML, of the sort that we've been able to do for 15 years now, you find that some people give one pattern and some people give another pattern. Let's call them A and B. And both these patterns are very common in the population. Um, it's, it's not far off 50-50. Now, the interesting thing is, if you go along to Strange Ways Prison and type the people there for AML, if you go to the prison population in general, you will find that 95% of the prison population have, shall we call it, pattern A. And if you home in on violent offenders and sex offenders, you will find it's as good as 100% have pattern A. Now, there's plenty of people in the general population have pattern A. Male and, male and female. So... <laughs> the, the other thing you might like to know is when the police have your DNA, one of the things they do is they do do that AML test and discover whether you give pattern A or pattern B. Now the question is, are you worried? Well, I am. They decide that that is a gene for criminal. Well, in a sense, it is a really good gene for criminality, isn't it? I mean. You know, none of the genes the Sunday Times comes up with or the Daily Mail for criminality has a patch on this one. It, statistically, you know, it's point zero 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 over, over through the wall association with particularly violent and sexual crimes. So, yeah, it is undoubtedly a criminal gene to beat all criminal genes. And the question is, you know, does this have implications for social policy, personal responsibility, the legal system, you know, supposing a bloke's been got for grievous bodily harm and he's been found guilty, standard sentence is five years, up pops his counsel, he says, my client has a pattern A. Now, you've got three options. You can say, well, my God, that proves that he's a, a, you know, unredeemable, violent criminal, lock him up and throw away the key. That's, uh, shall we say, the sun option. <laughs> <laughs> You have um, the Guardian option, which uh, says, oh, poor fellow, you know, it's not his fault, it's his genes what made him do it. They had to give him some counselling and uh, a social worker and uh, get him out in the community and let's uh, try to help him. Or you can have uh, what we might perhaps call the uh, independent answer, which says, I'm not interested. He did it, the sentence is five years, down you go. 
the question is, should we be thinking about that sort of thing? Because I wish to stress, this is not a hypothetical case I'm talking about. This AML gene variant does exist, is tested for, does have those properties. What's the general spread of, the, of that gene in the general population? Not far from 50-50. So, yeah, there's loads of people out in the population who have that variant and who aren't murderers or whatever. But nevertheless, so the, the percentage of those in jail represents a very tiny percentage. That's quite true, yes. That is quite true. There's only a small percentage of them are in jail. It's a bit like the XYY chromosome, if you remember that one that came up some years ago, where, again, it is true that being XYY really is associated with the sort of actions that land you in prison, but it is also true that only a small proportion of all XYY men are in prison. Most of them are leading lives within the normal spectrum. You didn't answer my question, though. No. What's the plot? No. <laughs> No, it tends not to be. Well, this is just like Shiraz. Is it 100% is it men? Some of you will know the answer to this all the time, namely that this test is a sex test. It's a genetic sex test. The variants depend on whether you have the Y chromosome or not. If you have the Y chromosome, you give pattern A, and that's the pattern that most of the violent criminals give. If you don't have the Y chromosome, you give pattern B. Now, the point, the reason why... <laughs> it is, well, if you've recovered DNA from a crime scene, it's not too obvious. Um, now, the reason why I did that was not to try and particularly, well, yeah, okay, it was to try and wind you up, I confess, but <laughs> it wasn't to try to mislead you or pull a fast one on you. What I wanted to do is, is this question of people's attitude to genetics, because I've given you some information, and I've given it the same information, but labelled in two different ways. Label A says, A male gene polymorphism, pattern A, pattern B. It's labelled genetic, and maybe you're far too smart to have fallen for that, but certainly if I do this for our medical students, it's difficult to get out of the room for the intensity of the arguments about the ethics and so on of it. If I give you precisely the same information, saying, well, they're men and women, you say, well, so what? And I think that's a very important aspect of our social response to genetic questions. I like to think of genetics as being a bit like a flypaper. It sort of hangs up there, and all people's buzzing ethical worries come and stick on that genetics flypaper. So people are conditioned. <coughs> it's a knee-jerk reaction. Anything genetic must be iffy, difficult, raise difficult ethical issues. Label it some other way, we're happy with it.